everyone. Welcome to episode 176 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. Here we are, two guilty Book Cougars, because we got a message from a listener that told us she was so engrossed in listening to episode 175 that she undercooked her Valentine's Day cake for her grandchildren. (laughs) It was mushy in the middle. Sorry, Diane. I told her that she should have just sold it as lava cake, which, you know, people pay a lot of money for those cakes. But she actually said her granddaughters didn't really care. But (laughs) sorry, Diane. (laughs) And thank you. We love hearing from people. Thank you so much for reaching out to tell us that fun story. It gave us a good giggle. Indeed. And congratulations to Julie. Yeah, Julie was our Patreon winner over on Patreon of our monthly giveaway book. Yeah, she won a copy of The Wise Hours, that wonderful book about owls that is on my TBR. I keep opening it and not getting very far, but I like what I've read so far. So enjoy. Enjoy, Julie. Yeah, and um, thanks for being a patron. We so appreciate you and and everyone else who's um, joined that community. It really helps. And we are doing a monthly Patreon only giveaway. If you are a patron, you're automatically entered to win. We draw the winner on the 15th of the month. So if you're not a patron yet, you have time to win the March book. Yes. And we do a giveaway every 10th episode then for listeners who are newsletter subscribers. And that is every 10th episode. So the next one will be episode 180. Unless we decide to do one ahead. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, but (laughs) you can always count on that uh, every 10th episode for newsletter subscribers. So if you'd like to do that, just head over to bookcougars.com and there is a subscribe button. Our March giveaway for Patreons is Bright and Deadly Things by Lexi Elliott. This is like a mystery book that takes place in the French Alps. Yeah, it has a beautiful cover. It looks so inviting. And then, you know, bad things happen. (laughs) <laughs> in those inviting places. <laughs> yeah. And um, the author was just a guest on John Valeri's Central Booking YouTube channel. So check out that interview. Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes for you. John always asks interesting questions. Oh, and I forgot to include his moniker here at Book Cougars. He's our mystery man. That's right. Yes. So Emily, what are you currently reading? I am reading our first quarter read along Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. I'm reading it and I'm listening to the audio version that's read by Nadia May. There's two different audio books, at least that I found. Yeah, I'm listening to the same one. Oh, cool. I really like her voice. Do you? Yeah, I do too. She has that nice like British edge Mm -hmm. that it's not exactly dripping sarcasm, but it's a friendly sarcasm or snarkiness maybe is a better word. She does change it a little bit for the male perspective, but it's not overdone. Right. Which sometimes is troublesome. (laughs) Indeed. Yeah. (laughs) I'm reading that too as well. So the text and listening, and I am enjoying it so much. It's just such a fun story. For those of you who aren't familiar, I would totally recommend you check it out. Even if you're not participating in the Zoom conversation that we'll have, it's just such a short, sweet story about a woman in books. Seeking a little bit of freedom. Yes. Yes. We'll be talking about this next episode in more detail. So more to come on that. What about you? Well, um, I am back into Outlander. I hadn't read it in a couple, probably a good week or so, because I was kind of immersed with some school stuff. But I'm still on the second book in the Outlander series, Dragonfly and Amber by Diane Gabaldon. I hit the 70% mark on this book. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, these are like ginormous bricks of books. I'm reading it on my e-reader at night before I go to bed. So slow and steady. Yeah, I'm thinking 70% is like page 962 or (laughs) something. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I haven't I, I haven't held a physical copy of this book. So I'm not sure how many pages, but it is long. But um, all is well for Claire right now. The Scottish Highlanders were just in another battle. Nobody slept for 36 hours, but they still had sex before going to sleep. So (laughs) all is well. Sounds very realistic (laughs) when you're 20. (laughs) 
Well, I am reading Field Work by Ileana Regan. This is a forager's memoir. Ileana also wrote the memoir Burn the Place. And that memoir was more about her growing up years in Indiana and also being the youngest of four kids and then creating this restaurant that became Michelin starred in Chicago. This book, Field Work, she's closed the restaurant. She's now spending time in Chicago, but mostly up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where she and her wife have purchased a farm with a lot of acreage. And she spends a lot of time, as the title suggests, foraging for things. And they've opened a and b there, which has a very short season because it's very hard to get there, particularly in the winter months. And she cooks things that are all things that she's foraged, which is really interesting. Totally. Yeah. Mm, I'd love to have one of those meals. Me too. <laughs> Definitely on my bucket list. Again, that's called Field Work by Ileana Regan. Yeah, I think the only meal I've had that was foraged was uh, one of my cousins in Nebraska and his partner, uh, Go Morales Picking. That was yummy. We talked about that cookbook I was reading last time about mushrooms. And I have a little bit of a fear of mushrooms. She speaks to that in this book. I mean, how important it is to know about the spores. And, you know, she's feeding people. So it's, yes. it's different if you're going to kill yourself versus kill others, you know. Right. So it's there. there's really interesting, as you like to say, synchronicity <laughs> of reading this book and having just read a lot about mushrooms in that cookbook. And there's so many different kinds of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And she learned a lot from her father growing up about how to be very careful and mindful. Part of it is eating a little bit and then seeing what happens, <laughs> which I think is really funny. But yeah, lots of mushrooms in this book. So most of the effects would happen pretty quickly? Yeah. I mean, particularly if it's highly poisonous. Okay. Because yeah. I know in the movies, you know, usually the king will have some lowly subject drink right. something first and... <laughs> People pause for, but you know, yeah, probably doesn't happen quite that fast. No, I don't think so. Cause it's also about exposure. It's like the more you have, the worse it gets. So if you have a little bit, I don't know how you tell like, hmm, maybe this is, I'm slightly poisoned versus like I'm yeah. on death's door. Well, you know, it's interesting too. Cause I have read stories where people take a little bit of a poison regularly so that they build immunity to mm -hmm. it. So somebody tries to knock them off with that particular poison. They survive. They're all good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about poisons. I know things like poison ivy. If you mm. get a lot of exposure, sometimes you build an immunity. Oh, my God. I'm not sure about oh. liquid poison. You know, there's a scene in the first Outlander book where one of the main characters wipes his butt with poison ivy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, what have you just read? Well, I have been reading a ton of articles and stuff for school, um, but I did finish a book that is actually related to a research project, and it's The Sunwise Turn, A Human Comedy of Book Selling by Madge Jennison. This came out in 1923, and Madge, along with her friend Mary Mowbray Clark, opened this bookstore in New York City in 1916. It was one of the first bookstores in America owned and operated by women. And they wanted to do something that was different than the big kind of warehouse bookstores. At least that's what Madge is talking about, creating something that's smaller, more intimate, a place for readers to come and browse and have conversations and share ideas and things like that. So they were around 31st Street and Fifth Avenue initially, and I love the description of one of the articles I read is that it was an address that was desirable 40 years prior. <laughs> so <laughs> at that time, it was, you know, changing. They lost their lease because the block was being sold. And so they moved to the Yale Club uh, and had a store in there. And that's right next to Grand Central still today. So this is Madge's experience of coming up with the idea of opening this bookstore, getting her friend Mary on board, and how she went about finding the space, creating it. It sounds like really different. Like the walls were painted like a burnt orange color, very modern for the time. 
And they also published some books early on. They had their own imprint, and then they did broad sheets as well. She's kind of my research topic this semester, so I'm looking forward to learning more about the bookstore and what they printed, because that's really interesting to me. And Madge left the business within about four years, even though the bookstore went on until 1927 when Mary sold it to a publisher because it was not doing well financially. I want to learn more about Madge leaving. I've heard a couple rumors in the archives. So more to come on her, but I really enjoyed the book. It's really a neat snapshot into book selling in the late teens and early 20s in this country. And one of the funny bits is just her talking about how bad the advertising for books is. She mentions at one point, like coming out of the subway and seeing bad advertisement and needing to just lie down for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> You mean because it misrepresented the book or it was just like they were trying to have it be sexy? No, just to it was get just attention? boring. Oh, I, I Boring see. and okay. just the same old thing is because she says at another point, I don't remember which outlet she was talking about, but she's like, every week, it's the same thing. The title is new books. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> can't they come up with something else? Yeah. So I think one of the reasons I want to look at the archives is just to see kind of like what kind of advertising did they do? What did they do differently? Mm -hmm. I think the broadsides that they published working with poets. So it would be a, a poem from a poet and then a piece of art, like a woodcut or something on the broadside. So it'll be interesting to look at those. And yeah. just see. But, you know, the spirit of the book is just wonderful. And it is in the public domain. So you can find copies online. And then there are copies floating around used that you can still find. Because I think it went up to at least five printings. So it's a fairly popular book. In its day, she was also a novelist and wrote short stories as well. So her name is out there if you look at old newspapers so I, I look forward to, to learning more about her adventure and their bookstore. And I think that they would probably be willing to come on to the book cougars if they were still around because they yes. sound like fun book people very much, you know, about sharing ideas and exposing people to good books. Yeah. So it really makes me wonder why she left the bookstore. If it was that she wanted to focus on her own work or if they had a falling out or didn't see eye to eye about how to move ahead with the bookstore? Well, one of the things I read is that there was a guy who was a friend of theirs initially, and he came in as a stockholder, he and his wife, and decided that Madge wasn't good for business. So he and Mary bought out Madge. Is or one forced her out, maybe. <laughs> well, that's one of the stories I heard, right? But then... It's interesting looking at their archives because some of Mary's archives are at the Harry Ransom Center in Texas, which I'm not going to be able to go anytime soon. But looking at the inventory of the archive, there's an address book from Madge in Mary's archive from 1958. And also an article that they may have been collaborating on from the 1930s. So I think they stayed friends mm -hmm. and Madge might have just who knows she wasn't happy. She does mention that after they moved to this new location, she was never really happy with it. It didn't have the same warmth or charm. So, you know, maybe she just had enough of it. Yeah. I mean, book selling is a hard business. It's a lot more glamorous on the outside. So maybe she just wanted more time to write, like mm -hmm. you said. Or read. <laughs> and read and travel. Right. Yeah. So more to come on her, I'm sure, because I just realized as a woman who's a former bookseller and current, you know, book lover, I haven't thought that much about women booksellers or printers in history, other than like Elizabeth Peabody mm -hmm. in Boston in the mid 19th century. There's not much out there, I don't think, on women who were booksellers mm -hmm. in printers. I mean, right. there are a lot on women who were involved in the newspaper printing. Learning more about women and book selling will be one of my missions in the next couple months. So that's The Sunwise Turn, A Human Comedy of Book Selling by Madge Jennison. And I should say The Sunwise Turn, that's an old Gaelic saying that you want to follow the sunwise turn because following the sun brings good luck. Hmm, that's which lovely. I think is lovely. Yeah. yeah. What about you? 
I finished a book called Moonrise Over New Jessup by Jamila Minix. This book just came out in January, and it's about Alice Young, who leaves her home in 1957. She's living in Rensselaer, Alabama. Her father passes away. Her mother's already passed away. Her sister, who she adores, has fled to Chicago to try to make a better life for herself. And she has an altercation with her landlord and has to get out of town quickly. And she only has enough money to catch a bus to get to Birmingham, Alabama. And she's on the way and they go through a town called New Jessup and she's encouraged to get off. So she gets off and she discovers that this is a town. She asks someone, where's the colored entrance to go into this I don't know if it was to go into the station or to go into a restaurant. I don't remember that part, but they're like, we don't do that here. And she said, what do you mean you don't do that here? And New Jessup was a town that was blacks only. Over the ridge, there was a Jessup that was for whites and New Jessup's was for blacks only. And this is really a period in history based on a, a true time in history where there were Blacks that were not interested in integration at all, they were very interested in segregation and creating communities that were comfortable for them to live in where they didn't have to follow any of the rules, I'm saying that in air quotes, of the day. So she ends up never getting to Birmingham, living in New Jessup. She loves it. She's taken in kindly by a couple And then ends up getting introduced to the local seamstress and working for her and learning how to create beautiful clothing, gets her own apartment. She's working two jobs as a seamstress and as a waitress at the local diner. And she meets and falls in love with a young man named Raymond, who comes from a family that helped to define New Jessup and from the very beginning, its creation. But as happens a lot with the next generation, he's not satisfied with that situation of New Jessup. It was at the time where blacks were looking to get the vote. And he felt like blacks should be more focused on getting the vote and being able to pass laws that were important to them. His father doesn't agree with him. So Raymond gets involved in an organization that's looking to do some different things Alice is very threatened by that because she was thrilled to find this town where she didn't have to worry about being a black woman. You know, she Mm -hmm. felt, feels like it's perfect. So it's a very interesting story. I loved the way that it was written. And I also did listen to the audio, which is narrated by a woman named Karen Chilton, who has a beautiful voice. Mm. So I did both read it and listen to it. And it's just a period in time that I knew nothing about. And I love reading fiction that helps me learn about things. Yeah, absolutely. That makes me think of Zora Neale Hurston, Mm -hmm. because she writes and I think lived in a town that was all black people. And I think there were some in Georgia and Florida as well Mm -hmm. that were uh, black communities. Yeah, yeah. I totally get the draw. I Mm -hmm. understand why people would be interested in living a life like that. And this book won the Pen America Award, which is an award that Barbara Kingsolver started. I'll just read the blurb on the back. Barbara Kingsolver says, My favorite novels light up my brain with things I hadn't considered before, and this one does exactly that. The deep complexity of the American civil rights movement, the various sometimes opposing approaches of its leaders to desegregation, the gains and inevitable casualties that social progress can claim. I thought that was a really good blurb. Mm-hmm. Again, it's called Moonrise Over New Jessup, Jamila Minix. Out now. I also read a children's book by Bonnie Tsui, who I talked about reading her book, Why We Swim, last episode. And when I saw that she also had a debut children's picture book called Sarah and the Big Wave, the true story of the first woman to surf Mavericks, I had to get my hands on it. It's a great cover. It's such a great cover. So it's this big wave. And in the lower right hand corner is a woman riding a yellow surfboard. Right. I should say it's illustrated by Sophie Dow. So basically, this is about a woman, Sarah Gerhardt, 
who was the first woman to surf Mavericks, which is like the biggest giant waves you can surf. And it was at a time when no women were surfing. So she had to be trying to do it on surfboards built for men, which made her job even harder. And eventually she helps to change the industry for women, partly because of getting equipment that's better suited for their body types and sizes. When it talked about who the illustrator was, she's an artist in San Francisco. As research for this book, she surfed a wave that she's pretty sure was over one foot tall, (laughs) which I thought was so cute. We've talked about this with kids' picture books when at the end they have a nice timeline to give some historical perspective. And Bonnie did that in the back. So it's the milestones in the history of women in surfing starting in the 1600s, where a Hawaiian princess was the first known surfer, all the way up to September of 2018, where they're talking about the WSL, which is the major leagues of international surf competition, announced equal prize money for men and women. Mm. And that was in 2018. So the timeline stretches from the 1600s to 2018. And then the other super cool thing is there's a page that folds up, which represents like the size of these, these waves that they're surfing. Look at that. Isn't that cool? That's totally cool. It says roaring down the wave at 30 miles an hour. And there's Sarah Gerhardt screaming down a wave. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. And the other thing I'll put a link in the show notes. Bonnie Soy just wrote an article that was in the New York times about a female photographer that goes into the big waves to photograph surfers, which is so cool. So again, this is called Sarah and the Big Wave by Bonnie Tsui. Very cool. Well, the only other thing I read was a short story by Willa Cather, because I'm still doing the Willa Cather short story project. Apologies to anyone who's following along. I did not do a reminder post this month because that just went swooshing by, and I can't believe it's the end of February But the story for this month was A Singer's Romance, and it was published in 1900. And when I was reading it, I thought, gosh, man, I'm having some deja vu with this story. Like, did I read it before? Because these stories that we're reading now are ones that were not collected in a book. They're not stories of hers that are readily available. You have to seek them out. But then it dawned on me like, oh, this sounds like a story that we read last year called Nanette and aside, and that was published in 1897. It's been kind of neat because reading these older stories that, you know, Katha wrote as a emerging writer, you know, you see her working out different themes with slightly different storylines and plots. And so it's really interesting. You know, they're not necessarily the best stories in terms of, you don't think like, wow, that was a great story. You see a writer working through things is the enjoyment that I get out of reading these. So both of these stories were about a woman opera singer, somebody who is very much at kind of like the height of her career, powerful businesswoman as well as artist, who has a young, beautiful maid in her life who was a daughter of a friend who died tragically. So it's that same type of character in both of the stories, different kind of storylines, but very similar in in that way. A Singer's Romance was a little bit darker, I have to say. I won't give any spoilers. But you can also see Cather working up to writing The Song of the Lark, which was her third novel that came out in 1915 about an opera singer, you know, from childhood to the pinnacle of her career. I enjoy tracing those themes. I just wanted to do this reading project just to get through reading all of the stories. So I haven't been keeping a close eye on the themes in particular, but some of them are just so obvious that you can really see them in her writings. Again, that was A Singer's Romance by Willa Cather. And you can join the Willa Cather short story project, chriswolak.com. We'll put a link in the show notes. I finished a book called I Am, I Am, I Am, 17 Brushes with Death by Maggie O'Farrell, another Maggie (laughs) O'Farrell. This is her memoir. And 17 Brushes with Death, I feel like that word brushes with death is the perfect title because it's like some of them she just came really near death, but obviously didn't die. 
but they also just represent death in a different way than one might think. And I think last time I talked about how her intuition gave her kind of a creeped out feeling when she was on a walk and a guy started talking to her and offered for her to do some bird watching with him and wanted to put his binoculars around her neck. And she was like, yeah, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And Mm -hmm. she went to report it to the police. And then a little while later, a young woman was found strangled by a pair of binoculars. She's terribly creepy. The book is separated into different chapters with headings like neck or circulatory system and things like that. So she talks about her early childhood experience with encephalitis, problems with her abdomen because she went to give birth and she had gone to her doctor and said, I've been told that I should never have a vaginal birth. I should have a C-section because of some of the illnesses I had in childhood. And they were like, oh, you'll be fine. He was like, get up and walk across the room. And she walked across the room and he said, you can give birth. And then three days into the labor of her first child, she almost died and they had to do an emergency C-section and basically all of her insides had to be put back in. And I felt like one of the themes of the book is definitely people not listening when she was trying to tell them things, Mm -hmm. you know, which can happen. As we know, there are great doctors and then there are doctors who are under too much pressure and aren't given enough time to listen. I know a lot of doctors and I know that some of it too is just they're under so much pressure. They're like, Oh, I've heard this story before you're going to be fine. Or Mm -hmm. they have eczema, just here's the here's the drug for eczema. And they're not digging deeper to say, well, maybe they have eczema because they're allergic to the world, which is what happens with her daughter. The very last chapter is, is called daughter. And then in parentheses, it says present the present. And she's gives birth to this child who's covered in scabs and just really uncomfortable and cranky and cranky. And she goes to take her to a nine month appointment where she had waited to get this appointment with a doctor. And then they don't even barely see her and just hand her a prescription. And she goes to look at it and to discover this is a prescription they've had forever and it didn't work. So the doctor never even gave them the time of day. And eventually she does see someone who really helps her, but her daughter is allergic literally to everything. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also beautiful because she talks about the relationship that her other kids have with her daughter and, you know, how it's just made you have to look at the world in a different way and be very vigilant. And I would say that's another theme of the book is vigilance about your own care and appreciation for these brushes with death and how she looks at the world differently because of that. The epigraph of the book is a Sylvia Plath quote from the bell jar that says, I took a deep breath and listened to the old brag of my heart. I am, I am, I am. Because I was wondering, like, where did this title come from? So I really enjoyed it. And in Chris' synchronicity, I also got out her children's picture book called Where Snow Angels Go. And this is her debut picture book. It's illustrated by Daniela Jaglenka Terrazini. The impetus for this book was that her daughter, this daughter I was just talking about with this severe eczema, is going into anaphylactic shock. They're in a ambulance screaming towards the hospital and she says to her daughter you're going to be fine it's just a snow angel wrapping his wings around you which was just she said off the cuff something I said and then what started to happen is her daughter wanted to know more about that so she started to tell her this bedtime story about snow angels and then eventually made it into this kid's picture book oh beautiful which is really sweet and I wanted to show you this one page see if I can find it quickly, where the young woman, Sylvie, who's the character in the story, is at school and she's daydreaming. And so the illustrator put the words on lined notebook paper, it's great. which I thought was a really cool way to illustrate that she was at school. And the illustrations are really beautiful. It's much different than the Bonnie Soy book. Both of them have beautiful illustrations, but very different style. And then this one, I would say, is for slightly older kids because it's got a lot more words. Again, that's called Where Snow Angels Go. And then her memoir is I Am, I Am, I Am. So two more books in my Maggie Farrell. (laughs) Awesome. Very cool. (laughs) 
I also finished Eleanor Lippman's newest book called Misdemeanor. If you're a fan of Eleanor Lippman, this one will not disappoint. I wouldn't say it was my favorite of hers, but I really enjoyed it. It's about Jane Morgan, who is a very accomplished lawyer in her law firm. She's also a cougar because she ends up on the rooftop of her building in New York City, getting it on with a younger associate in her firm. And across the way is a peeping Sally who sees that these two are having sex on the rooftop. She takes pictures and then reports it to the police. And because she's traumatized by the incident, the police can press charges. And so they do. And Jane loses her job at her law firm and is put on house arrest in her building with an ankle bracelet and cannot leave the building for six months. Holy smokes. You yeah. think that actually happens? Well, interesting. You should ask that. I will talk about that more in Biblio Adventures because I got to see Eleanor Lippman talk about this book. In the acknowledgments in the back, she talked about all of the lawyers and police chiefs and everybody that she talked to because she wanted to make sure she got it right. And yes, if someone reports that they're traumatized, then they can press charges. Even though this woman was traumatized, she was still able to take pictures and submit it to a local newspaper so that Jane's life was embarrassingly wow. ruined. Because I used to live on this great apartment building where there is a wonderful rooftop. So just asking for a friend. <laughs> you should see Chris <laughs> blushing and smiling. <laughs> well, because it's private property, which is interesting, right? right? It wasn't like they were out in a park. But yes, the answer is yes, you can be, you know, there can be consequences. So Jane's consequence is that she's on house arrest in her building. For those of you who read A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls, this book kind of reminded me of that because that character is living in a hotel. I mean, in much different circumstances, but it's just everything takes place in that building and this one was similar. So Jane is a twin and her sister is a dermatologist and is very in charge and has lots of ideas about what she thinks Jane should be doing with her time now that she has so much time, including doing TikTok videos <laughs> that are going to benefit her sister's dermatology practice. Okay. I was going to say not of having sex. No, so yeah. no. <laughs> And so Jane starts cooking and she finds another person in her building who's also on house arrest named Perry, who she starts cooking for. That's all I'm going to say about it. It was a very fun, sweet, very quick read. I mostly read it on the train down to New York and really enjoyed it. Again, that's called Miss Demeanor. Very fun play on words by Eleanor Lippman. And the last book I read is called Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. This book is out on March 7th, so just around the corner. So the epigraph in Pineapple Street is, Millennials will be the recipients of the largest generational shift of assets in American history. The great wealth transfer, as finance types call it, tens of trillions of dollars are expected to pass between generations in just the next decade. And this is from Zoe Beery, the New York Times. And then the other epigraph is, I live in Brooklyn by choice, Truman Capote. <laughs> so when I read that epigraph, I was like, oh my gosh, this book is right up my alley because I'm very interested in that. That's something that people in philanthropy are talking a lot about. There's going to be a huge transfer in wealth. And the younger generation has a very different opinion about what they think should happen with this money. And they're much more, I'm using very general terms. Mm -hmm. Many of them have issues with how the money in their families came to be and, or just feel like they want to give their money away because should they have $37 million in their trust fund? Do they need that money? Mm -hmm. Which I'm using 37 million because that happens to be the number in this book that is in this young woman's trust fund. So when I first started reading it, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to spend a lot of time with the Uber 1% because it's dripping with wealth in that way. So I kept reading other books in between, but it was my e-reader book at night, you know, coming back to it just like you're doing with Outlander. And it has some weight, this book, and I ended up really enjoying it. It's told from three different point of views, three women 
Sasha, Georgiana, and Darley. And Sasha is the married in to this family. She married Georgiana and Darley's brother, Cord. And these two sisters refer to Sasha as the gold digger, which gives you some insight into how they feel about her. So I'm going to read this paragraph. This is one of the chapters from Sasha's point of view. And um, Sasha had dated a man prior to marrying Cord named Mullen, just to give you some insight, because I think she refers to him. While it hurt Sasha that her family seemed unable to accept her breakup with Mullen, she was also moved by the way they made room for him. They saw his own family was lacking, and so they folded him in, setting out a stocking for him at Christmas, keeping the pantry full of corn checks and Pop-Tarts, foods only he ate, Sasha had initially thought that was what married life would be like, that she would marry Cord and his family would fold her on in, but they didn't. Her own family was a restaurant booth. You could always scoot in and make space for one more. Cord's family was a table with chairs, and those chairs were bolted to the floor. Wow. Isn't that a great way to describe how she felt coming into this family of uber wealth? She was from a very pure mid-class upbringing and the family just would not accept her the sisters referring to her as the gold digger and she had even signed a prenuptial agreement and everything she was not in it for the money at all and Sasha is an artist and has a very different outlook on life so I really did end up enjoying the philanthropy part of it I don't want to spoil it Georgiana is the youngest sister and she does work for a nonprofit. And she's someone who has $40 million in her trust fund, but here she is working for a nonprofit. And she comes into contact with one of her classmates. She went to one of those hoity-toity schools. He's a kid who's also a trust fund that's starting to question what he thinks his family should be doing with their money, which of course can be very threatening to the older generation who's worked really hard to make that money in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've talked about it in the past, too, that some of the uber wealthy people don't want to leave their money to the children because they think that it messes up the kids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, the kids know from a young age it's not their money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. And Darlie, the other sister, did not want to have a prenup agreement with her husband. So then the way it was treated was she doesn't get any of the money, but it's handed down to her children. Oh, so it's like skipping a generation, but then that generation is going to, you know, have to make some decisions when the money is in their pocket. Yeah. It's so fascinating to think about this extreme mm-hmm. wealth and how do you manage things and what is the purpose of your life if you don't have to work mm-hmm. or vice versa? Isn't it lovely to work and not have to worry about how much you make, you know, you can work for a nonprofit making very little money and that doesn't matter to you. You can just do good. Make a contribution in Mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's called Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. It was a little gross, but then I really liked it a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I can see how, I mean, I I understand that how uh, you can be kind of repelled, but then you keep getting drawn back to it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's that fascination with how the upper 1% live, Mm -hmm. right? This novel definitely paints a picture of that community. For sure. I guess I think of it as a luxury to think about what do I want to do with my life from a young age? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have to worry about supporting yourself, yeah, what do you do? That immense amount of freedom can probably be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and also just how many of our decisions, we talked about this many episodes ago. I can't remember the name of the book I read now. But it was about me trying to understand my own relationship with money and how so many of our decisions are made with that lens in mind, which, you know, there's reality, we have to do that, but also how to kind of improve your relationship with money so that you're making decisions wisely, right? you know, not feeling paralyzed by it maybe Mm. is the best way to say it. So this is the opposite where some of the characters like, you know, they don't even think about money. It's not in their lexicon, even though it kind of is because everything they're doing is spending a lot of money, right? But they always had it. So they didn't really have to think about it. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. But like I said, had some moments with it as well. So, Biblio Adventures. Oh, we went on 
a wonderful couple together, actually. Mm -hmm. We had two Biblio adventures together. We did. We went up to West Hartford and saw a play called Indecent by Paula Vogel. Yes, at the Playhouse on Park Theater up there. Great production. I mean, I hadn't seen it before. I didn't really know what it was about. But I thought it was so well done. It just really drew me in the stage setting. I always forget the names of the stages, but it's the kind of stage where you have the audience on three sides of it. You know, they really have to work with movement for the audience to see everything. I really enjoyed it. I did too. And there was a lot of music and singing and they actually had characters playing the instruments, which was so beautiful. Yes, playing them well. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there was a violin, an, an accordion, oboe, an accordion. Yeah. Yeah. Really wonderful. There also were actors who played multiple parts. And at one point, the accordion player had her accordion under a trench coat, <laughs> you know, and was playing a man and to just make her bigger. I thought that was so clever. And yeah. then she turns around and goes just kind of slightly off stage, rips off <laughs> the trench coat. And there she is in the next scene singing and dancing and playing her accordion. Yeah. They did a lot of those types of character changes. And what I appreciated was it was all done slowly. Mm -hmm. So you never felt like it was a hectic thing happening. It was almost like it was the passage of time in some way, even though they became different characters. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. appreciated that. So the gist of the story, if you want to check it out, is that a man writes a play. He's a Jewish man who writes a play about two women falling in love together. And it's performed all over Europe to great acclaim. And this is during like the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And they go to America. And what happens? They get censored. And people get sent back to Europe, they get deported. And the Holocaust is raging. So it's a painful show in a lot of ways for the censorship and the murder of Jewish people and queer people. But you are left with a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of that, I think, had to do with the staging and the way that they balanced the sadness with the hopefulness. Right. But, you know, two seats down from me, there was a woman just sobbing oh, yeah. at the end. So it was very heavy play. It was. I definitely was teary eyed at mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. The hope is there. It's a spark. But right. there's so much awfulness that happens. Yeah. But really, I thought an amazing play. Before that, we stopped at the new Riverbend bookstore up there in West Hartford. Yeah, it's beautiful. You'd been there for their opening. I had on Independent Bookstore Day, I went there and it was their grand opening. And it's very similar to their one in Glastonbury, which we'd been to together where it's in an old house. So it's separated into different rooms, which is a really cool way to lay out the store. Yeah, really well done. It's, you know, white light bookshelves. So it's airy. And it just feels so clean and open. Yeah. Yeah. That was really fun. Enjoyed that very much. They had some cool sidelines mm -hmm. as well. And one of these days, I am going to take advantage of those mystery date books, you know, where you have a book that's just wrapped and it says, this is the thriller or, you know, something yeah. that I've never done that. Yeah. Last week when we did our Friday reads on social media, one of our listeners had done that at their library. And I'd never seen a library do that. And the book she was reading was one that was her mystery date from her library, which so I thought cool. was super cool. Yeah. 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 That's a fun idea. Well, then we went down to the Big Apple. We did. We had a uh, lovely two days in Manhattan. We missed Aunt Ellen very much. Yeah. It wasn't the same without you, Aunt Ellen. No, it was not. Um, but yeah, great time. We went, I, I did research at the archives there at the New York Public Library. That was great. Looking at Madge Jennison's papers. She's the one who wrote the Sunwise Turn memoir about being a bookshop owner. So it was kind of cool just to get a sense of who she was as a person. And there's one file that had just tons of postcards. As early as like 1894, a lot of them were from the teens, 20s, 30s. And in one of the first ones I read, it was a postcard home to her parents saying that she had a good time and she met some woman and she tried to convert her to become a suffragist, but it didn't work that well because <laughs> the woman just wanted to go home to her husband. 
And then their house had burned down so she could kind of understand. <laughs> I mean, the things you read in postcards are really fascinating because and sometimes like you're just walking into a, a story that's ongoing. Right. But the way postcards were used back then were so different. It was almost like there were some that says, hey, sorry, I haven't written. I have a long letter started. We'll send it soon. Mm. So like these postcards are just kind of going like, you know, quick little no, it's almost like a quick phone call. Or one of those emails where you're like, I'm sorry, I, I haven't mm -hmm. had a chance to really read this email thoroughly. I'll get back to you. Yes, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So we went down on a Wednesday, did some work at the library. And then in the evening, Emily had an exciting event. That's right. Our buddy Kate has talked literally for years about these events called Book the Writer, which was started by the author Jean Humph Korolitz. Yes. And she's the author of The Plot and The Latecomer, among other books. And she brings in writers into the living room of a Manhattan apartment. And you can sign up to be a part of this very intimate setting and conversation with the author. So I knew that Kate was going to go there to hear Eleanor Lippman in conversation with Jean Humph Korlitz. And I was able to snag a ticket and meet Kate there. And it was really cool because it was also in the apartment. For any of you who are Marvelous Miss Maisel mm -hmm. fans, it was in the apartment of, I think, Maisel's parents on the show. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. Yeah, it was really nice to be in such a close, intimate conversation with Eleanor Lippman. And Jean does all the questioning, you know, like she comes with a clipboard filled with questions, but then she did open it up. And it really became a conversation where you could ask any questions that you had. And that's where Eleanor Lippman was talking about that she was insistent, even with the arcs that went out, that the acknowledgments appear. Because sometimes you'll get an arc and it'll say acknowledgments to come in the final copy. Mm -hmm. But she wanted to make sure that the arcs had the acknowledgments because she had done so much research and talked to so many people to make sure that she got the lawyer parts and the, you know, all the legal stuff and police parts correct in the book. That's really great. I mean, that's wonderful and very smart of her because reviewers then will have that to work with as well and maybe yeah. not question things. Exactly. Like this could never happen, mm -hmm. you know. And she, one of the people she talked to was the chief of police that she grew up with as a kid. And so she would call him all the time asking questions about ankle bracelets. And she even asked him about people having sex in public. And he was like, Oh, my God, all the time, all the time, you're knocking on windows like, hey, hey, take it inside. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was funny. The other thing I wanted to tell you is she went to Simmons. Oh, cool. Which I thought you would find interesting. And Stacy Schiff, who's a very famous biographer, was her editor. And now she's not an editor anymore, but she still runs her books past her. So she's really lucky. And the other thing she talked about is that um, the book is dedicated to her friend, Mamiv Medwed, who she met in a, like an adult writing class 40 some odd years ago and has read everything Eleanor Littman's ever written and sadly, she was very ill when Eleanor was writing this book. And so this was the last book that Mimi will ever read of Eleanor's. So that was very poignant. And she talked about her friendship with her. So it was a really fun event. Yeah. But I was worried about my buddy, Chris. Well, we, you know, we trucked up. This was on the Upper West Side. And the library, the main branch is like Midtown Manhattan. So we had a big subway ride up north. And then caught some food at a wonderful little market. So one of the things I love about New York so much are all those little markets with great food. Mm. So we ate outside. It was such a warm day and we just found a bench and ate outside. And so Emily went one direction. Well, we went together actually first to check out the bookstore where I was going to hang out while Emily did this event. And it was called Book Culture. Right. I was so worried about Chris. What's she going to do for this hour? Well, I didn't have to worry. Oh, yeah, not at all. So, <laughs> yeah, because we were like, should I just go to Ellen's or anyway, went up there, had a great browse at that bookstore. And when Emily called and said, OK, we're ready to roll here. My first thought was like, already? Like that went by so fast because <laughs> the first floor is all new books. And then the second floor is new and used 
textbooks as well. It's near Columbia. So many great used books, really well curated. I was struggling a little bit with my research ideas, and I found a book that I did a really heavy skim on while I was standing in the aisle about writing research. I think it was called How Scholars Write. And there were some good chapters in there on research that wasn't necessarily anything I haven't encountered before, but it just calmed me down and gave me that reassurance that, yes, you're doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were feeling a little overwhelmed at that point. And this was just day one. You you were going the next day to tackle another whole set of boxes. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's like, okay, I calmed myself down, petted myself a little bit with a book. It's, it's always <laughs> helpful. But yeah, great bookstore, book culture. I'll definitely head back up there. Me too, because I only really got to walk up and down the stairs and then head to my event. I would love to go back there. And the neighborhood in general was just so cool. Yeah. So it'd be fun to explore. Definitely. And the bookstore, you know, they had some nice seating around as well. And there was a gentleman who'd fallen asleep and was <laughs> snoring softly. And I was like, man, this is like perfect ambiance, you know? <laughs> well, the other thing I miss about New York, and I love when we go there is, you know, like, yeah, the bookstore's open till 10, you mm-hmm. know, which we don't have much in our little sleepy town. Yeah, so, bookstores. Yeah. I mean, if they're open until seven, that's pretty late yeah. for a bookstore in Connecticut, it seems. Yeah. And then we went and spent the night at Ellen's, which was so lovely. And the next morning got up and met Matthew Goodman. Yeah. Matthew is an author who has been on the podcast before. It was so great to connect with him. We had breakfast at a fantastic restaurant. It was my first time. Russ and Daughters. Delicious. Oh my gosh. So delicious. Classic New York breakfast. Yeah. So that was great. So we had breakfast with Matthew And he actually had some books to pick up at the New York Public Library. So we all hopped on the subway together. And of course, with Matthew being a local, he knew all the best stops to hit to get to where we wanted to go uh, most easily. Yes, it was so nice not to have to worry. Yeah. Even like, no, sit at this end of the train, you know, it's always so nice to be with a local. Yeah, so that was great. So the day two at the New York Public Library went well for me. How about for you? I got to work in the, it's called the reading room. The right? Rose, yeah, the, the Rose, Rose reading yeah. room. Beautiful. I got a lot done. I was tempted to run around the city and then I thought, just go in there and work, which I did for both days that you were doing your work. Yeah, so, that's yeah. a gorgeous room. That That is the huge room where it's kind of like the money shot. Right. It's a <laughs> whole block long, gorgeous wood paneled with bookshelves and beautiful ceiling painted. And we also got a chance to quickly stroll through the Virginia Woolf exhibit, which is there right now. Yes, that was really interesting for a lot of reasons. One, there was a connection to Madge Jennison, who wrote The Sunwise Turn. So she initially starts talking about the spark of starting this bookstore was having read Clive Bell's book, Art because it influenced her so much. I haven't read it yet, but Clive Bell was Virginia Woolf's brother-in-law. So he married her sister, Clive, and Virginia had a really good relationship. Do you remember what that placard said? It was something like they had a very fun and playful relationship that was not sexual, but it was erotic. Oh, right. And Chris was like, "Uh uh-huh. And the picture, (laughs) the picture was them like romping through the ocean in swimsuits. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, but really neat exhibit. They showed a lot of her journals. I guess Mm -hmm. she liked to experiment with different formats of journals. And there was one where she had a backing different sizes that she sewed together with her journals. So people who study her, which I don't really, but I do know that she thought of journal writing as an art form Mm -hmm. in itself and journal creating. I mean, she literally was making these journals out of different materials. It was pretty cool to see. Yeah, totally. So that was really great. And that exhibit runs through sometime in March. Mm -hmm. Not really sure when, but a nice surprising thing. This is my first time back since the pandemic inside the library because they moved the bookstore when you walk in through the main doors, it used to be off to the right in an area that was not designed for it. Right. But during the pandemic, they had this big renovation of a space that is now when you walk in and you go a little bit to the left, 
that's where the Virginia Woolf exhibit is. It's a small exhibit room. And then just past that is the brand new bookstore that is much larger with a little cafe attached. Yeah, it was really nice and big and really heavily populated. Yes. <laughs> there yes. are a lot of people shopping there. Yeah. Now, if you go to the library and you want to get to the bookstore, they keep business hours. So that bookstore closes at five. Keep that in yeah. mind. Keep yeah, but it's mind. smart because when you first walk into the library and you go straight ahead, they have a permanent exhibit, Treasures of the Library. I don't remember the exact title. But when you go through that exhibit, they have a door now that leads into the bookstore, yeah. which yeah. is smart, which we've noticed a lot of museums do that mm -hmm. now. When you're leaving the museum, you don't walk out the door, you walk through the bookstore, right. which is a great way for them to help get income. Sure, for sure. And they yeah. had really nice, beautiful things. So we had a great couple of days in New York City. Oh, we also went to Kinakunya. Oh, right. Yes. So Thursday, when we finished our work day, it was just so nice and warm, just great evening. So we decided to eat in the city and we went to Kinakunya first, the big bookstore, and had a wonderful browse, particularly in their stationery section. Right. Go downstairs. Oh, my people. gosh. Yeah. Go downstairs. <laughs> I mean, books are upstairs. On the two flights, I think the top floor is is more manga. Um, the main floor is, you know, fiction, nonfiction. And then the basement is also a bunch of manga, but a ton of stationary stuff. Really cool stuff. And we found, it was so funny, we both found these journals and we're walking around with them and we met each other in an aisle and we're like, oh my God, look at this journal. And we both <laughs> had the same thing in our hands. I know. And you have to understand, I mean, there's, a mile of stationery there yes. and we both picked up the same thing and it's these really cool wire browned notebooks but with this soft plastic wire the spiral binding, the yeah. spiral yeah. yeah it's soft and but firm it's you called, know it's called soft ring <laughs> sufa s-o-o-o-f-a soft ring we'll have to do a little video with them yeah i'm in love i am too and i got one i don't know which one you got i got one with the grid paper I got one with dots and then blank. Okay. Yeah. I got them without the little elastic, elastic thing to hold it. Um, yeah. Different colors, really nice. And the paper is very shiny. Not yes. shiny. What would you call it? Soft. There's a word supple. for it. Yeah, supple. <laughs> you can stroke she's, it and it she's, feels nice. She's stroking her current notebook as we talk about it. <laughs> It was a great couple of days. And then we got on the train and went home. Yes, we did. And we were home by like eight or nine o'clock. Yeah. So it was an unplanned trip. I mean, it really kind of came about quickly. It came together. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad we had that couple of days to just be back there because it's just so energizing. It is. At one point, the gentleman caller called me and he was like, how are you? And I said, I love New York. And he just started <laughs> laughing. And I said, it just makes me want to be alive. I just love it. And it reminds me, this is why I moved here and how hard it's been during the pandemic to just not be able to go down there. Yeah. Exactly. And we miss Aunt Ellen and we issue a book cougar thank you to her for letting us use her apartment. Absolutely. In her absence. Yes. And we talked about you there and the fun memories we have because we used to stay there with her during book expo yeah when book expo was a thing and had a good time i remember that one year we watched gone with the wind <laughs> that's right over two nights i think it was yeah because yeah. Yeah. that was a of... read-along that we were doing with with jenny actually yep yeah lots of good new york city on ellen memories and more to come i'm sure mm -hmm. so we got a great email from Anne in austin about a series on apple tv called truth be told based on a novel by kathleen barber called are you sleeping i watched the first episode of the first season and it stars octavia spencer and she plays poppy parnell who's a podcaster I love Octavia Spencer, and she's really good in it. The gist that I got from the first episode is that Poppy Parnell became very famous for doing a podcast during a trial where a very famous author was murdered in his own house while his two daughters and wife were upstairs sleeping. It was like at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. And the young man that was 17 years old, the neighbor next door, 
was charged with the murder and treated as an adult and put in prison for life. And as this first episode starts, there's a question to whether he is truly guilty or not. So now Poppy, who became famous for following the trial and really on the back of this kid being guilty, is now questioning whether he was guilty or not and wants to do something about it. I'm hooked. (laughs) I watched it with the gentleman caller. I don't know if he's hooked, but I'm going to carry on. So there's three seasons. It reminded me a lot of Serial. For those of you who listened to the Serial podcast, which was the first really serialized podcast that came out with Sarah Koenig, it reminded me a lot of that. So again, that's called Truth Be Told on Apple TV. What about you? Sounds good. I'll have to check that out because I love her, Octavia. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a Biblio adventure with actually the TA for my, the history of the book class did a lecture. She's in England this week doing research and she gave a lecture for the Bibliographical Society and it was a talk on the library of the Elliots of Minto, 1738 to 1938. So they were this prominent Scottish family like Southern Scotland near the border, who were book people. Each generation had different levels of bookishness, but it was fascinating. And Megan was the librarian at the Grolier Club for 10 years. So to call her a TA is kind of misleading. She definitely is a rare book expert, and she's working on her PhD now at Simmons. So this research that she's doing was really fascinating. I mean, just from how she got involved with it is that there were catalogs of their library at the Grolier Club. And so that's what got her started on this research quest to understand their library and how it was within the house and how it changed and what happened to it eventually. So it's kind of cool because, you know, talking about these wealthy people who had estates would have a library. And where was the library placed? And in Scotland, in the 1700s, a lot of them were on the second floor or the top floor, away from all the hustle and bustle of the house and everything that was going on. And then by, you know, I guess maybe the early 19th century, they started going down to the first floor. So that's just interesting, too, to think about private libraries and architecture and how things change over time. So really interesting lecture. I look forward to hearing more about her research in the years to come. Do you have any upcoming jaunts planned? I do. I have one on the books that I just found out about today. This is going to be on February 28th, which is, I believe, the day that this episode drops. It's an event at the Beinecke Library right here in New Haven at 4 p.m., It's Bruce Halsinger talking about his new book called Cow, Codex, Collagen, The Many Lives of Parchment. Oh, wow. So for somebody studying book history, it's a a great event. (laughs) Right up your alley. Yeah. How about you? So I wanted to let people know about two spring book events. The Newburyport Literary Festival Mm. is April 28th through the 30th. They're doing a hybrid. They've been all online the past three years. They're doing hybrid this year. So I think the 28th and 29th are in person in Newburyport, and then the 30th will be Zoom. So that's a cool way to do it. And then Booktopia, which we've talked a lot about Booktopia, Chris and I met via Booktopia, is going to be up in Manchester, Vermont at the Northshire May 5th and 6th this year. Yeah. You can go to the Northshire website and purchase tickets. We will put a link into the show notes. They also have the list of authors that are going to be there. So you can start reading books now. It's a great list. We're not going to prattle them all off, but we will give you a link to find out. It's just a great place to meet other book people and meet authors and have conversations. And so we highly recommend it if you're so inclined. And don't be afraid to go alone. I went alone. I didn't know anybody the very first time I went. And it's everybody's there to talk about books. It's a friendly crew, even if most of them are introverts. <laughs> right. So, you know, that yeah. is the funny thing, right? Yeah. A bunch of introverts getting yep. together and having a blast. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
And then I'm going to California to visit Aunt Ellen, and she has scrolls worth of things we're going to do in the time I'm there, including a moth story slam, which I'm really excited about. That is so cool. I will be reporting back on that. Take lots of pictures. Oh, we will. Upcoming reads. I had planned to take a break on my Maggie O'Farrell-a-thon And then I was visiting a little free library the other day and came across The Vanishing Act of Esme Lennox by Maggie O'Farrell, which is another one of her novels. So amazing. Oh, my God. And it has a border sticker on the back. Oh, my. (laughs) Look at that. It sure does. Wow. Memories. Yeah. Yeah. How cool. And then we also on the next episode will be hosting Amy Tector. And her Dominion Archives mystery, Chris has talked about the first book in the series. The second book, Speak for the Dead, is going to be coming out very soon. So that's on my list. I can't wait to talk with her. I really enjoyed her first one in that series. Yeah. Archivist in action Mm -hmm. with a mystery. Well, I am really excited that the publisher sent us some advanced reader copies of The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley. A Poet's Journeys Through American Slavery and Independence. This is by David Waldstriker, and it is a thick biography of Phyllis Wheatley, who was a black enslaved woman who was an amazing poet of her day. She was very learned, and it's over 400 pages, so I have school going on. I don't know when I'll get to this, but I'm super excited about this book. Yes, and in the Out Now category... Enchantment, Awakening Wonder in an Anxious Age by Catherine May. I loved this book so much. If you are a fan of wintering, this book is very different, but also similar. So check it out. All right, everybody. Happy Happy reading. reading. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.